Hey guys, how's it going? I got a little sidetracked. It's actually uh, 7 a.m. now. I'm going to continue with the second chapter in Collisions. And uh, I might take a break after that and then do the third and the fourth a little later. Or maybe not. I mean, anyways, doesn't matter, right? <laughs> so Collisions chapter 2. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you. And for them at Laodicea, and that makes you think of, you know, Revelation, where they talk about the church of Laodicea. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts, oh, I'm sorry, I realize my microphone's not even close to me. You can probably, hopefully, still hear, though. Anyways, that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love. You know, figurative language here. I'm not talking about stringing physical hearts together, like some horror movie or something. <laughs> Unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. Uh, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. You know, and it's interesting, at the, in verse 1 where he says, you knew what great conflict I have for you. So what exactly does that mean? You know, he's conflicted for them, he's concerned about them, he's praying for them, he's thanking of them, saying that he's in them, he's with them in spirit, even though he's not with them in the flesh. Um, and again, here we see, you know, contrast too with the flesh and the spirit. Again, and I've said, you know, in that teaching of mine, dichotomy versus trichotomy, where people teach, you know, trichotomy, that man is made up of body, soul, and spirit. We don't see that in Scripture, though. We see a lot more there being a contrast between the flesh and the spirit. Okay, there's two parts to man. There's a material and there's an immaterial. He's absent in the flesh, but with them in spirit. Anyways, let's continue. I don't know what to say a whole lot about that that passage there. The next one's Alive in Christ, verse 6 through 15. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. And we see the language there of receiving Christ. Receiving Christ. Walk ye in him. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith. As ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving, you see about being rooted in the faith. Again, reminds me of the parable of the sower. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tra tra traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That's a verse that we see used a lot by people, you know, exposing false doctrine and so forth. Uh, it's a good one to memorize, I guess. Colossians 2.8 Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. You know, it makes me think a lot of <clears throat> how science, you know, falsely so-called, um, you know, people teaching evolution and so, and, and so forth, uh, you know, unbiblical. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Obviously, that's a huge verse, you know, for the deity of Christ. Basically says that he is God. Basically, that's pretty plain language there. Um, you know, the Jews would think that saying something like that would be blasphemous. Uh, because that implies that Jesus is God. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's basically saying Jesus is God. 
and ye were complete in him which is the head of all principality and power in whom also ye, and you know it talks about being complete in him and i guess i've that kind of laps my mind every time that i've came across perfect in philippians and colossians where he mentions you know those who are perfect perfect can also mean complete um so that's something i didn't i forgot about and um that's something to think about when you come across that word. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. And again, I think that saying that he's the head of all principality and power kind of gives him, you know, um, you know, it's saying he's all powerful, you know, in the sense that only God could be. Um, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. The circumcision of Christ is the true circumcision. Buried with him in baptism, where, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins, and in and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Have forgiven you all trespasses. And people try to play these little games where, you know, trespasses aren't sins and stuff like this, but, you know, it means pretty clearly that you're forgiven of all your transgressions, all of your sins, all of your trespasses, any wrongdoing in the sight of the Lord, completely forgiven by the blood of Jesus by his resurrection, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. I'm just going to continue on to the last section here in the second chapter of Colossians. Let no one disqualify you. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of in holy day or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. And so we see, um, you know, that those Old Testament things that the Jews did were a shadow of things to come. And, uh, you know, this is where we get typology, and we get shadows and patterns and stuff. We see specifically mentioned here a shadow of things to come. These things were a shadow. So we can use that term to explain, you know, types. Um, because actually the King James Bible doesn't use the word types, it uses figures. Uh, but that's always been something I've been interested in. That's something that people take things out of context a lot too, and it's abused, but we see clearly that it is mentioned in Scripture. So, you know, there is, it can be used biblically, but it can also be abused, which it is a lot. The study of figures, the study of, you know, shadows, patterns in the Scripture. Let no man judge you. You know, obviously people can judge, but, uh, you know, saying that, uh, you know, that's not what following Christ is about. It's not about following these ordinances, okay? It's about following the Lord, loving the Lord, you know, with all your heart, your mind, your soul, with all your strength. And um, let's continue. Let no, no, no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, introduce, or intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Again, that's an interesting verse. Um, and I think I've talked about that before, but I'm really not going to say much about any of that right now. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increase, increaseth with the increase of God. And not holding the head. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? So he's basically saying, you know, some, don't let someone, you know, um, deceive you and tell you that you have to be following these ordinances or whatever, or you're, you're, or you're sinning or you're going to hell if you don't do these things. 
and um, rob you of, you know, the grace of Christ and living, um, you know, not having to follow these ordinances. Uh, there's liberty in Christ. And so I think maybe that's kind of what it means when it says, let no man beguile of you of your reward, you know, walking in the grace of Christ and the liberty that we have. It doesn't mean, you know, that you lose your salvation. I'm sure that's what somebody could use. They could use that verse to try to say that. Um, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why is the living in the world? Are you subject to ordinances? So actually, I really kind of like this passage a lot. Um, and I want to look into that deeper. Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. I'm thinking that, you know, the section they've labeled here is let no one disqualify you. And it says even, uh, let no man beguile you of your reward. But disqualify you makes it sound kind of more like you could lose your salvation. Even little titles like this can be deceptive or can, you know, lead you into certain doctrines. And I'm not necessarily saying that this is wrong, but I'm just thinking, you know, uh, You know, it could be, you, you could have been titled other things, you know, let no man judge you. And, you know, it's not about the ordinances and stuff, is basically, uh, but let no one disqualify you. It kind of makes you sound like, you know, kind of makes it sound like the reward being spoken of is salvation and that you can somehow be disqualified from salvation. Maybe that's just me thinking that, but anyways, I'm done with this chapter, and so I'll move on to the next soon. God bless. Thank you.